So hello everyone. Um, today we have Gautam Basu Thakur, who will be talking about this fantastic book, Postcolonial Lack. We're delighted that he's joining us today. And um, in many of our interviews so far, we've focused somewhat on clinical issues. So today we're moving more towards Lacanian social theory, although of course that doesn't preclude clinical issues. And we're going to try to explore some of the most crucial topics that Gautam uh, introduces in this invaluable text. Gautam, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you, Derek. Uh, thank you for having me. So let's start off then. Um, in this book, you offer a compelling case for the use of Lacanian psychoanalysis, Lacanian concepts in the field of post-colonial studies. Now, of course, this whole era has a somewhat checkered history in respect of the relationship to Lacanian psychoanalysis. Um, early on in post-colonial theory and post-colonial studies, uh, Homi Baba was a big point of reference and made some very path-breaking contributions. But there's often been a somewhat antagonistic relationship to psychoanalysis. So just keeping that in mind as the conceptual backdrop, I suppose then my question is why this conceptual move? Why is Lacan, Lacanian psychoanalysis, so crucial for post-colonial studies? And, and how is it that you go about making that argument in, in post-colonial lack? When I started this book, I obviously started off from that basic question, is post-colonial studies dead? What can we do to make it relevant in the present? And I stake in this book the argument that a more robust engagement with Lacanian theory would allow us to reimagine the context conditions of both colonialism and post-coloniality. Now, one question would be, uh, why Lacan, why not someone else? I mean, there's a personal reason, of course, I have been a student of Lacan for a very long time. So that's, that's my kind of go through area. But also the other, I think the more important reason is, uh, while I do not dismiss colonialism and post-coloniality, or do not dismiss reading uh, colonialism and post-coloniality in terms of economics and power structures, I also think, uh, and this is where I kind of connect with Franz Fanon, that colonialism brings to the surface the question of ontology. What does it mean to be a colonized subject, as well as what does it mean to be a colonial master? And what are the issues of, of, of subjectivity and its relation to our ontologies as essentially lacking um, or very put simply, uh, in terms of speaking subjects, desiring subjects, what have been the uh, tangible and intangible effects and affects of colonialism on the minds and the bodies of those who have gone through that experience, either immediately during the era of colonialism or even its aftermath. It occurs to me actually that you know maybe there's pronouncements about post-colonial studies is on the demise, so on and so forth. But where one does see a very uh, <clears throat> invigorating and critically absolutely imperative linking of Lacanian to post-colonial ideas or anti-colonial ideas is I think increasingly in, in the move to think Lacan alongside Fanon. Um, and much of what you've written anticipates that, I think, uh, and we, we, will, we will return to that topic. But I suppose I'm just also thinking about the issue of ontology that you raise and um, how for Afro-pessimism, uh, a particular reading of the norm, uh, the zone of non-being, um, the, the idea, the Fanonian quote, that in the eyes of the, the white man, the black man has no ontological resistance. All of these seem absolutely crucial. So I'm hoping we'll return to some of those but I wanted to give you a quote from the introduction to your book, um, just to, I suppose, foreground what I think is, is part of what is most crucial about how you're using Lacanian psychoanalysis to do something slightly differently. So you say, um, this is on page 14 of the, the um, introduction, post-colonial studies must move from interrogating the politics of symbolic difference to exploring the excess surplus or lack that lingers in the wake of exercises of self-representation. Uh, 
So I like this, this, this shifting, this uh, conceptual realignment or conceptual reprioritization, not just to focus on symbolic difference, but also an attention to moments of excess surplus, as you put it, or, or lack. Um, you follow that up by saying, post-colonial studies must accomplish the critical task of turning away from the symbolic to the real. So just two questions then, how does that look or what should one focus on in this move from looking at the symbolic or prioritizing the symbolic to the real? And maybe a reiteration of that same question, when you say post-colonial studies must move away from interrogating the politics of symbolic difference to looking at excess surplus, I suppose that is in, in a sense the same question. Could you elaborate a little bit more? It, it sounds like it very fundamentally shifts how one approaches um, looking at texts, looking at post-colonial topics, looking even at notions of subjectivity in, in colonial, anti-colonial and decolonial contexts. What I wanted to do is throw into the mix the certain impossibility uh, that always attends these kind of symbolic enunciations or articulations. Uh, that is to say, that which remains always excluded from the symbolic, that which cannot be symbolized, yet that which lingers in the symbolic and causes a vast array of concerns and consternations and disturbances and disruptions. If, and as I've tried to do through my chapters is, by looking into certain a range of cultural texts, if we focus on these eruptions, these lingering moments or these lingering um, eruptions of what cannot be symbolized, what, what remains unsymbolizable, what does it mean then for uh, post-colonial studies as a discipline? Uh, and how can it reorient post-colonial studies from just looking to you know, excavate silenced voices and, and move towards thinking about just by returning those voices to a certain positive claim is not enough because something still remains um, un, unmitigable in, in those kind of symbolic um, understandings. So, uh, in, in, a, in a sense, I mean, I've, most Lacanians would find this to be a very simple move of looking beyond the symbolic towards the real or looking at how the real operates within the symbolic, not just as a limit to the symbolic, where the symbolic collapses, where the symbolic can no longer uh, adequately function, but also the real as constitutive of the symbolic. And I think that's something I have been uh, trying to do in, in, in uh, at least in the first chapter where I look at the very well-known notion of uh, subalternity coming from Spivak, uh, which Spivak uh, famously uh, and concisely uh, defines as uh, subalternity is a position without identity. So the subaltern is definitely part of the social space yet it lacks the, the, the uh, ability to um, gain access to the center. Uh, I have tried to think, for example, in that particular chapter, uh, how it is more than the question of the subaltern gaining a positive identity and what it means to think of the subaltern as that uh, eruption, as, as a real, as a kind of radical negativity within the symbolic, which has the power or force of destabilizing the symbolic and therefore exposing the very uh, fiction of symbolic as some sort of authoritative um, normative order of existence. 